Hello and welcome to today's session number four in the series, Starting a Food Co-op, What You Need to Know. Today's session is Developing and Managing a Timeline with Bill Gessner. My name is Marilyn Scholl and I'm the manager of CDS Consulting Co-op. We've had a, over 50 people who registered for today's seminar and we're glad that you are all here. We have two more seminars uh, in this series. The next one is coming up in two weeks, April 13th, with PJ Hoffman on preliminary store design. Also joining us today is Stuart Reed with Food Co-op 500. We're glad to have you with us, Stuart. Hello. If you want to ask a question today, uh, type in your question. Uh, the question section is located also on the toolbar on the right side of your screen. Uh, type in your question at any time. Uh, we, will, we will monitor those questions and let Bill know when there's a question that fits into his presentation. Um, and then we'll un unmute you if you're using a telephone so that you can uh, ask your own question. If you're on the computer, we'll ask your question for you. So I think that's um, everything we need before we begin. Bill, would you uh, introduce your guest and take it away? Thank you, Marilyn. Um, and welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to be with you here again today. Uh, our focus today is on developing and managing a timeline for your startup food co-op project. And uh, we have with us today two guests, uh, guest presenters, uh, who are actively involved in, a, in some food co-op startup projects, one in New Orleans and uh, one in Keene, New Hampshire. And I will introduce Mac and Bonnie in just a, a little bit here. But first of all, I want to um, um, show you the, our agenda for the day, and um, we're, um, we'll spend a little bit of time just talking about how it, the value of a timeline as a tool uh, and how a timeline functions in a project like this, and then uh, looking at how to create your co-op's timeline using the four cornerstones and three stages development model that is uh, featured on the Food Co-op 500 website. And we'll look at a couple sample timelines. And we'll have time for discussion and questions. And in the last five minutes, we'll kind of wrap up and talk about future webinars and, and be done at the top of the hour. So we have a 60-minute session here today. Our uh, <coughs> desired outcomes uh, are shown here. And um, just saying that you will develop an understanding of how to create a timeline used as a management tool for your startup food co-op, how to integrate your co-op startup project with the four cornerstones, three stages model, and uh, how to manage a timeline uh, that achieves accountability, avoids unrealistic expectations, and builds momentum. So those are our learning goals for the day. And um, we uh, have uh, with us uh, two presenters. I'd like to introduce, first of all, Mac Lemon, from who is the board chair uh, for the New Orleans Food Co-op. And Mac, are you there? Yes, Bill. And um, in a in a welcome. I'm glad you're here today. In, in a in a few in a moment or so, I'm going to ask you to give a kind of a brief background of your project, and we'll come back to this slide. Sure. And uh, also, we have with us today Bonnie Hudspeth. Bonnie was a guest presenter in our second webinar related to a development budget, and uh, or, or building a, or our first webinar, I believe it was building a shared vision. And uh, Bonnie is with Monadnock Community Market in Keene, New Hampshire. Hello, Bonnie. Are you there? I am. Hi. Nice to be on today. Great. And I'll also we'll come back to this slide when we ask you to comment a little bit about your co-op in just a few moments here. Um, Absolutely. Um, so timelines and uh, food co-op startup projects. I, I, I see that... Um, startup food co-ops, as well as 
existing food co-ops that are planning a major expansion or a new store have a very difficult time working with a timeline tool. And I suggest and recommend that you uh, find a way and find a format that is workable for you uh, to create a timeline and use that as a tool. And when you think of it, the timeline is valuable in the sense that it shows a roadmap of your project. Uh, it is a management tool that allows you, especially in, for startup food co-ops, when you're kind of wrestling with the question of how is your project going to be organized and how is it going to be managed, a timeline is a real essential tool there, uh, focusing on the what and on the when and on the who. Uh, we're mostly today in our examples are going to be looking at the what and the when. Um, but as you continue to work with the tool and refine it, you begin to add more dimension to it, including the who. Um, so the, the timeline is a very important planning tool. And it also serves as a communication tool. Um, initially, just amongst your kind of your core leadership group. Um, and it allows, as a communication tool, it allows people to see the big picture as well as to see the details. Uh, it gets everyone on the same page. Uh, it, it helps to create and build accountability um, as part of your organization and part of your process. And it also illustrates and defines the major decision points that you're facing in your project. So all of these together say that, yes, this is an important tool. And it's one that you don't just create one day and then not look at again, but you continue to work with it and refine it and revise it as you go forward. Uh, without a timeline, it's very easy to to simply step, step into quicksand and never emerge again because you, don't, you can't delineate and make any distinction between the different stages of your project. You get lost. You get out of sequence. You get ahead of yourself. You lose perspective, and you lose accountability. That's not very good. So, so um, I'm a, an advocate of, of of what I call a one-page timeline. And the idea behind a one-page timeline fits in well with the idea of getting everyone on the same page. And it's not that you can't have a larger, more detailed timeline that would, that would not fit on one page unless you made the font size so small. Um, but that you begin with, and as a cover page, so to speak, that you have a one-page timeline that shows the major stages of a project uh, in the four cornerstones and three stages model. Some of you are familiar with that. Some of you are not. But there are three stages, stage one, two, and three. And then as you progress, uh, as you progress in that, you stage two has two substages. And then stage three has four substages. So it gets a little more complex going from stage one to two to three. Um, but the, the idea is that you develop a, a timeline for your project that fits within those stages. And we'll illustrate the stages here in a bit. Um, a one-page timeline shows the big picture, the full picture, the complete picture. Uh, and you use supporting schedules to show the detail that can't be shown on one page. Um, sometimes people will work with Gantt charts uh, that can be very effective, uh, but they're hard to have on, on one page. More often than not, you're looking at a, a computer printout, and it might be multiple pages or looking at it electronically. But again, if you're using a format like that, I encourage you also to think about and try to work with the one page version as well. Um, I'd like to, um, at this point, uh, ask Mac to um, to introduce himself a little bit and talk a little bit about the New Orleans Food Co-op and where they're at and how they've uh, either used or not used a timeline in their 
Um, how many years has it been, Mac, the, the, the people have been working? Uh, the co-op's been around for several years, and we've um, had a couple of setbacks when it's come to finding a location for our store. Um, and obviously the storm uh, affected us greatly. Uh, right now we're in the midst of a one-year, as Bill likes to say, very aggressive timeline to try and be open by this coming January. Um, and we've used uh, some timeline tools that Bill shared with us to um, mark out the important milestones that we need to reach, like uh, securing the lease with our landlord um, and hiring a general manager are some of the big ones. Uh, we also have um, funding deadlines that we have to meet, or that we would like to meet, I should say, um, in terms of member equity as well as uh, outside sources of funding. Um, so we've been working real hard through volunteer effort to uh, achieve all of these goals, um, but as it said on that last slide that we were looking at, uh, the timeline will be revised and you know we've had to adjust it um, slightly, but the, the important part is that we communicate clearly and set clear expectations about how that, that happens and what the new expectations will be. Great. Okay. And uh, people looking at the slide here can get a little bit of an idea of the type of store, size of store that you're looking at, and uh, number of members that you currently have. Um, where do you think you are? Um, do you agree currently that you're in, in stage two of the, of your, of the timeline, Mac? Yeah, um, we are in the middle of searching for a GM, or we're just starting the process of searching for a GM, uh, who we hope to hire by June, and we're starting negotiations with our landlord about the lease. Um, we have a membership campaign going on right now. We actually have 100 more members than it shows on the slide at this point. Oh, so that's uh, an increase of 100 members in the last couple of months. Then. Yes. Yeah, that's excellent. Good. Okay. Um, Bonnie, would you like to introduce yourself a bit and uh, comment on your co-op in Keene, New Hampshire? Sure. So um, we are behind where the New Orleans group is. Um, I would say we're mostly finishing up the stage one of development. And we've also, though, kind of skipped ahead in that we've already completed our market study. Um, but the just in terms of ha our use of the timeline, um, we, we weren't u really using a timeline at the beginning, and we got a little bit of out of sync with the four cornerstones model. So um, I had spoken with Bill about creating a draft timeline, and it's been very helpful in um, gelling our group and um, coordinating the efforts of all the working groups so we can stay on target in terms of our member equ equity goals and um, our the different stage goals and really synchronizing them. Great. And so at this point, you don't actually have any members officially, is that correct? Correct. Our plan is to launch the membership drive at a large community festival, um, the Monadnock Earth Festival, that will be happening on Saturday, April 24th. So that's our goal to really launch the membership drive and get it started. So by April 25th, you'll have a lot of members. That's the plan. Good. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you. Um, and you're projecting to be open uh, in early 2012, is that correct? Yes. OK. Very good. So um, these are two living and surviving examples of people who are very dedicated and uh, working with groups of uh, core groups and leadership groups in their communities that are very dedicated to getting a co-op open. And we'll uh, look more at their, in more closely at their timelines, and we can direct some questions to them as we proceed here. So I want to come back uh, just briefly to this idea of creating a timeline and encourage you to, if you haven't done so, to, to do an early first draft and to realize it won't be perfect and you won't know everything you need to know and you won't you by tomorrow you will even know more than you know today but create your timeline today uh, and then revise it tomorrow or revise it next week or next month as you gain additional information um, I find that it is often easiest to work backwards from when you want to open your store 
uh, you know, part of this is an exercise, and it will help you determine if your if you what you're aiming for is achievable or realistic. And you might sketch out a timeline that says you're going to open in August of this year, and then as you work backwards, put, putting in all the things that need to be done, you will find that it may be August of 2011 or August of 2012 before you realistically can open. So again, a timeline is a planning tool. Um, and you, and I encourage you to kind of think of dates by which uh, major steps or decisions need to be uh, completed um, by. And it's not so much the um, the the time at which you start work on something, but to begin with, think of completion dates. And when you look at completion dates, if you think at all, then you'll have to think, well, what is involved in order to complete this task? And when do we need to start that? And so that all comes after that. But being clear about when, you're, when you desire to have a completion date, uh, I believe, is, is the um, is a is a better way to approach it. Um, Can I chime in, Bill, and say that our GM search is a good example of this? Yes. Yeah, that we decided we or you advised us that we should have a GM hired uh, six months prior to opening our store, so that put us in June of this year, and so we counted backwards from there to decide when we needed to um, start the project or start that process of hiring. Yeah, and I think I recommended you know at least six months before opening. So you, <laughs> you can have a general manager on board nine months uh, in advance, that's even better, but uh, at, at least six months. And so, yes, working that into your timeline. Um, and, you know, keeping, again, keeping the big picture on one page, uh, using additional pages for detail. You know, find a format that works for you and your group. I'll illustrate a few formats here, but, you know, I've, I'm not I don't think there's one perfect format for timelines. Also, timelines should allow for flexibility and multiple focus. Um, there, it's not necessarily a sequential one-step thing that you do this first and do this second and do this third, but in reality you're doing multiple things at the same time, but they can be grouped by stages, and that's what we will illustrate. And that you will revise your timeline at least regularly, at least monthly, and I encourage you to seek professional assistance to help create or critique your timeline. A little bit more about flexibility and multiple focus. Um, uh, again, action steps are not, it's not a one at a time sequence. Uh, things are happening at the same time. And and you're developing, you're intentionally developing your ability and your capacity to have a multiple focus. Uh, and you know, can you, can your organization be doing three things at once? If that, if you can, that's a, you're building your capacity. Uh, can you do 20 things at once? I don't think so. Uh, you would need to prioritize and say what's most important. What are the three most important things to be focusing on during the next? A month, and then developing a plan to achieve that. Um, a timeline is very similar, and it, it really segues cleanly into a work plan. So, as you're planning your work, showing it in a timeline, you begin to then be able to create work plans that show in more detail, you know, what will be done, by who, by when. So. I'd like to say, and I've, I've seen this many times, is that your, your food co-op will resist, and will resist with great vigor, uh, the idea of having a timeline. Uh, and it'll especially resist the idea of using a template such as the four cornerstones and three stages model. Uh, the resistance will be based upon the idea that your project is unique and different and special than everyone else's. And it won't. Your project won't want to be fenced in. But I suggest that you take that it's the discipline that it and the practice that's required to take your project 
and fit it into a three-stage template uh, is very good practice. Uh, it will it will free your project uh, and give it you know give it the needed structure to really blossom. Uh, moving through the three stages of a timeline, um, let's take a, just a, a quick look ahead here and say here is a, a quick illustration of the four cornerstones and three stages model. And uh, as we were talking about, we can have little slides here that illustrate each of the cornerstones that form the foundation for your development process. We will, I include the slides here. We're not just for your reference. We won't go through them all at this time, but they're good to review. And then when we see the three stages in an overview slide here on number 19, um, we can see stage one being an organizing stage, stage two being a feasibility stage and planning stage, broken into substages 2A and 2B. At the end of stage 2B, is when you secure a site with a lease agreement or a purchase agreement with contingencies. The dotted line represents contingencies. And then you go to work in stage 3A, finishing all your design work and getting all your financing and fundraising in place and collected and closed. And the final decision point is at the end of stage 3A after the pre-construction period. And that's represented by a solid line. Once you cross over that solid line, there's no turning back. So we have descriptions here of the different stages. Um, but I also look at here, we have an overview of the, the stages by time range, what we typically see. Um, we have the stages by decision points. These have all been part of earlier webinars, but I include them here again for your reference. Um, and we also have the stages by suggested member thresholds, assuming you would have a store, um, let's say in this example, 6,000 square feet, uh, that by the end of stage one, you should have at least 300 members at the end of stage 2B, when you sign a lease with contingencies, you should have at least 600 members. And by opening, at least 1,000 members. And you may very well want to set goals higher than this. I would really encourage you to, to do that. These are very minimal numbers. Um, so, so that's a, a, a quick look at, um, at the different stages and to think about the decision points that are embedded in a timeline, uh, and that there are a series of decision points that your group will be working through as you progress through the timeline. The initial decision or action to organize a food co-op is not the final decision point. So in other words, you're making decisions as you're going along, but you have not made a final decision yet in, or in terms of committing to a specific site and passing that no turning back point. So it's kind of like the decision points are kind of like climbing a ladder. And in each of the stages and sub-stages in the three-stage timeline, at the end of each of those is an important decision point. And usually midway in each stage or sub-stage is also an important decision point to assess how you're doing are your assumptions holding up that what you're proposing and what your vision and what your dream is is proving to be feasible? Or are you gaining information that's saying, well, I don't think we can quite do what we were aiming to do. The market study said that a store in this location would not yield enough sales to really make it worthwhile. So we need to shift our focus. That's you know, that's learning as you proceed through the process. So those are some quick points uh, about, uh, about um, a timeline. Um, and, and one last thing here, you know, 
trying to determine which stage of the three stages you are at currently. Um, typically, I find that co-ops are doing things out of sequence. And that might be OK for a while, but eventually it'll catch up with you if you don't progress through the timeline in, a, in covering all the things that need to be done in each stage. So if you're in stage one and you've jumped ahead and doing some things in stage two, kind of like Bonnie's example, the Monadnock Community Co-op, I uh, worked with Bonnie and said, OK, let's create a checklist of the things still that are still remaining in stage one that you need to do before you can really close the door and say, you've moved from stage one to stage two. Um, so we'll illustrate that in a, in a moment as well. And what about incompletes? Uh, if in stage one there are things on your checklist that you haven't done, and you're saying, well, we're moving into stage two. Well, you have to look at that and say, are some of those things essential to have done before you go into stage two? And they're probably in stage one for a good reason. But let's say your checklist has 10 items, and you have nine of them complete, and you have the nine most essential complete. You can carry an incomplete forward into stage 2A, but make sure that you attend to it in stage 2A. So that's some of my thinking there. Um, so I, wanna, I want to um, illustrate a little bit uh, an example with the um, with the uh, Monadnock co-op. So here's an example of a timeline that is developed. The latest draft is dated March 17th. Uh, the idea is with every draft of your timeline, you put a date on it. And uh, you see that here is items from stage one, um, checklist of items that need to be completed before phase one is complete. So um, Bonnie, do you want to comment a little bit on these? And if you can comment briefly in saying kind of where you're at with this checklist. Absolutely. So um, two of the board members are actually sitting in the room with me right now. And they've been really active on the governance committee. So. Um, our, we can already check off creation of board of directors. We, we just created our board, and we have our first meeting in two weeks. Um, and we are at that point, we will approve the bylaws and incorporate. Um, so we're going to be able to check off a number of the items from stage one. Um, but the clarity of roles bit, I think we're going to be, we're hoping to work with um, CDS and potentially with Mark Goring about really training the board. A lot of the folks around the board are, at this point, have a good understanding and conception of co-ops, but not necessarily the policy governance model. And um, five of the directors have been to a board training already, but we're hoping to make that a priority in, in the next couple of months here, making sure to get everyone on the same page. So that's kind of emerged as, a, as an important uh, area of activity in stage one for you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then and I the, think it will. The, I was just going to say I think it will be, of course, um, really important to do ongoing board training. And it's funny because as I was in the process of recruiting board members for the first board of directors, a lot of folks said, you know, they should really use the co-op model in our businesses, whether they're the CFO of the local hospital or um, nonprofit director, so it's kind of neat to hear that feedback. Mm -hmm. So you're spreading the the co-op message there. Uh, yeah. in, in terms of membership, uh, so you're also doing some work to bring definition to what the member equity requirement is, uh, what member responsibilities and benefits are, and then you're planning a, a membership drive that you earlier said you'll be launching in a uh, towards the end of April. Yes. And I think, I think that's actually a perfect time to speak of an example of why the timeline really, there was a huge need for a timeline all of a sudden, is that we've had this one steering committee that's transformed into the board. And then we have three working groups or subcommittees. 
And what was happening is that the marketing and membership group felt like they couldn't do anything until the bylaws were complete in terms of researching what the membership, for example, doing draft membership brochures. And after the timeline was shared with them, they realized, oh, we need to be doing all this background work so that when the bylaws are complete, we can be prepared to launch, even though we're waiting for specific details from the governance working group. So it was really good to get all the working groups on the same page. And I think that's where the timeline is really going to be essential as we move forward. So, so for people being able to see the bigger picture and understanding how all the parts fit together and then developing a structure where you have, where you're doing more than one thing at a time. Exactly. So then we see, uh, so this is stage one, the organizing stage. Uh, so then we can see a projected timeline here. Um, uh, launching their member membership drive by April 24th. Uh, it doesn't tell us when they begin planning the membership drive, but it says when they're going to launch it by. Uh, by May 26th, so within one month, finishing stage one, in other words, being able to check off all the items above, for, you know, for the most part, 95%, let's say, and if there will be 300 co-op members that will be signed up. And if you plan your membership drive uh, appropriately and are well organized and as you launch it, I think that's very realistic so that you can get 300 people signed up in a month. Um, you might have them all signed up by April 27th, I don't know. Um, and then we see that entering uh, um, by, by June 28th, uh, uh, stage 2A would be complete, and that's very quick. Uh, that's like a month's time there. Um, but they've been, but the Monadnock Co-op has been doing a lot of work on stage 2A during stage 1. So I think it is possible, but they're saying that even by that second month, they'll have added another 150 members. Um, and building on the momentum from stage one membership drive. Uh, and then October 1st, so that would be uh, July, August, September, there would be three months to um, complete stage 2B, which means uh, having a business plan complete, members up to 650, hiring a general manager, and securing some financing. Uh, uh, planning for a member loan drive is complete and ready to launch. And at the end of stage 2B, by October 1st, they will have theoretically and hopefully secured a site, you know, with a contingent agreement that defines their, you know, their rental structure and or their, if they're purchasing a site. Um, so then we go f uh, stage 3A goes is a six-month period from October through March of 2011 uh, when they uh, complete a successful member loan drive, have 800 members, all the bank financing in place, all the design work is complete, and construction is starting once you complete stage 3A. So stage 3A, again, is that final decision point uh, when you think, when you have to say, okay, do we have everything in place? Is our, all our feasibility work still holding up? Are we ready to cross over the line of no turning back? Um, so um, construction starts on April Fool's Day of 2011, uh, a year from now. And what do we have that six, seven months? Construction is complete. Um, one month to prep for store opening, opening date of January 2012. Uh, will this timeline be the actual timeline? It may be, but more than likely not. It'll, it'll be different, and this document can be revised. Uh, here's another way of looking at the stages in a little bit more, a little bit more detail, but very similar to what we just covered. So that's an example from the Monadnock Community Co-op, and uh, this document will be available online for people who wish to download it and take a look at it. And also available will be a document uh, that the New Orleans Food Co-op 
we've been using in this document. It's a little more challenging probably to comprehend here, but it kind of came out of a, a site visit. I worked uh, with the New Orleans Food Co-op in January on site for three days. And out of that came kind of a refinement of their timeline. And at the beginning, just to show a format here, I listed some what I viewed as critical issues related to their timeline. And having that up front and then showing their timeline in the, again, in the format of the four cornerstones and three stages. Um, stage one, where they completed that in July 1, 2008, uh, co-op reached 300 member level at a board and an action team with working committees. Um, but it wasn't until a year and a half later, basically, that they completed stage 2A, uh, their feasibility work at the end of 2009, and then currently in stage 2B, which is scheduled to end tomorrow, I believe it is, March 31st, uh, which time they need to have a site secured with a lease agreement, uh, which they won't have, so they will be behind, and you know, it'll be important to kind of revise this, and you know, well, it looks like the, I think as Mac said, and Mac, you can comment here in a moment, but uh, that you're looking at entering into a second letter of intent related to your site, uh, you know, will that be sufficient to allow you to move into stage 3A? Or, you know, I would recommend that you really need to have your lease agreement in finalized before you, you know, with all your rental terms and et cetera, finalized before you move into stage 3A. So this format here is, is uh, a little bit different, but it shows the different stages and it shows the tasks that need to be done uh, for each stage. And it shows a, a potential opening, which Mac is now saying likely won't happen. I didn't necessarily think it would when we did this draft, but we're saying maybe as early as November of 2010, but maybe more likely with delays, the store opening could be February 1st, 2011. Uh, there's still a lot, a great deal that needs to come into place. Thinking of opening 11 months from today, uh, given the amount of, you know, financing and fundraising and lease and hiring of a general manager and that work that needs to be done. But uh, the idea is you keep pushing at it and you revise your timeline as you need to. Uh, Mac, do you want to comment a little bit about, you know, kind of where you're at? Uh, and how, with stage 2B, can you check off some of these items? And, and uh, are there other I, items we're working on? Yeah, I'm happy to talk to that. Um, we uh, are entering a second letter of intent. And you know, the question is, can we move forward with that? Uh, we think it's sufficient at this point. We've identified our external um, funding sources. Uh, we're preparing for a second phase of our member loan campaign uh, from last year. Um, our, let's see. But I, uh, we have uh, updated our accounting systems, so we have a much better sense of where we are fiscally. Um, as you say, Bill, it's a work in progress, and you know we've um, extended our timeline a little bit, and we're thinking about it a little more realistically. But I think that we need to just keep pushing ahead, um, you know, while we're still waiting for some of those financial ex external sources of finance uh, to come together and things like that. Um, the idea is just to keep moving forward. Yeah. So the kind of the period of time that we see here, uh, where we can see that stage two A kind of took a year and a half, and so there were some, you know ups and downs and some, you know, being stalled and stuck at different points uh, along there. And do you feel that, you know, those, do you feel that momentum is now, that you're moving forward in a better fashion now? Well, that was before I was on the board, Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, we had some trouble with our, um, our landlord during that time period. Uh, I had to look for an alternate location, um, uh, let's see. And so 
as you say, there were kind of fits and starts. Our um, our working our action team, excuse me, our action team system uh, was not as efficient as our current working group system, um, where the board is more directly involved. Uh, anyway, so I think we've um, created an interim management structure that's really helping us to uh, get the work done that's needed to get that momentum going. Yeah, so you had to kind of redesign your, your internal working structure um, yeah. in, in that process, so that, that's good. So uh, anyway, these are um, examples of, of how timeline documents can be used. Now this was this one that we're looking here from the New Orleans Food Co-op was kind of a report that was issued to them, and then they've had taken this and adapted it into other formats where they are using a timeline. So uh, again, whatever format can work for your group, that's fine. But the, the key thing is, is it working? And is it effective uh, as a management tool? So. Um, So um, I think that takes us, um, you know, back. To, we've covered many of the slides here, and uh, Marilyn, I'd like to see what kind of questions we have. Uh, yes, you bet, Bill. There's a question from Gretchen. Gretchen, do you want to tell us uh, where you're from and what your question is? Yes, I am. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Yes. I'm from the Old Orchard Food Co-op in St. Louis, Missouri, a small community outside of St. Louis, and we're in the same stages that Bonnie is, and I had a question for her on her member drive, whether she had a model of an application she could share with us, or what kind of information is she uh, seeking out, and I guess Matt could, could chime in on that too. Um, and I guess I'm curious whether you're collecting money when you do the drive, or are you just getting applications and interested parties and then collecting member loans at another point? I'll speak very, I'll speak very quickly, but then I think it would be great to hear from Mac too. Um, we, when we launch, we will have a system set up. We'll have a bank account set up and a system for accepting funds. So as soon as we launch our member drive, we will be collecting um, the $200 member equity at that point. Okay. Is your application simplified, or are you collecting, you know, just data to find? Because I'm sure that a lot of the people that are going to be members are going to want to become more involved once they do get tied in. So I guess I'm wondering what kind of data you're collecting from them. Yeah, that's a great question. The marketing working group, uh, marketing membership working group is working on revising that pretty much on a daily basis at this point. So I would be happy to share with you um, our latest version. But we're in the, we've been looking at a lot of other food co-ops in our area for different models. Um, for example, the, um, the co-op River Valley market opened up in Northampton, which is um, just about an hour away from us. So we, they've just gone through this process of doing their, their member drives just a couple years ago. So we've been using materials um, from exchanging and exchanging ideas with other food co-ops in our area. But um, yeah, I'd be happy to share the draft, um, final draft, whenever it is we have it. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, we also have our brochure online. You know, we collect contact information. Um, we have a space where people can uh, list any skills that they think might be useful to the co-op so we can follow up with them. Um, we definitely try and collect monies, you know, while we're um, tabling at different events around town. Um, you know, we accept checks, uh, we accept cash, and we're um, going to be able to accept uh, PayPal online uh, payments. Okay. Bill, another question is, um, how do you balance optimism and a realistic approach uh, to a timeline when you're setting your targets and goals? You mentioned a couple times um, the, the date that you thought, well, would they be open by then? Probably not, and and I'm just curious how you balance that optimism mm -hmm. and realism. Yeah, it it is a a push pull type of thing. Um, you know, I think when you're developing your timeline initially, you're using it internally within your leadership group, and you're not necessarily broadcasting it out to your community. As you begin to do broad community outreach, you your message is 
is not going to be that you're planning to open a co-op next open a f retail food co-op store next month, but your message is you're planning to open a retail food co-op store, you know, as soon as you can, you know, work your way through the planning process and raise the, you know, get enough members on board and raise enough capital to do that. So you're not necessarily promising a date. But meanwhile, internally, you have a a date, and maybe you have two versions of the timeline, maybe one showing you opening um, in January of 2011, and maybe another one showing you opening in July of 2011. And looking at the two of them side by side, which is which looks most realistic, um, which gives you the best chance to be successful, uh, which example will allow you to build momentum at a pace that will really bring results for you. Um, sometimes groups will have an initial burst of enthusiasm and excitement, but they will not be they will not have the organizational capacity or depth to sustain that. And so then the message is out in the community and people are expecting the store to open in two or three months, and then they see two or three years later, it still isn't open, and then they really begin to wonder. And so being clear on your messages and not making promises on things that you can't deliver are very important. Bonnie or Mac or both, do you have any comments on how you have thought about the balance between optimism and realism in developing your timelines? I think it's really important to maintain to be researching contingencies, um, you know, just in case something. Yeah. So researching contingencies. Uh, did we maybe lose Mac there for a moment? I think we did. Uh, Bonnie, do you have any comments? Um, I think I would say that the timeline that we have is very aggressive, and I think everyone on, on board is really clear with the understanding that. It is aggressive. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be a stress, but at the same time, it should be a constant reminder to keep us on target. At the same time, what we've incorporated is um, the necessity to party and celebrate accomplishments and building blocks, so that there's um, beyond, there's more than just the incentive of checking off a stage. It's really celebrating and at the same time building up that optimism and that spirit and realizing we are one step closer to the co-op doors being open. Right. So you're looking at a uh, potential opening in, what was it, January of 2012? But you know that could extend longer, uh, you know, by six months or a year or even longer. Uh, and so managing your project, uh, you need to kind of keep that possibility in mind, um, you know, as an alternate scenario or as a contingency plan, uh, you know, and as you, you build the capacity of your group and people are committing to to the vision that is the shared vision that you have, you know, the length of time that it typically takes to bring that, you know, to open a store on, on a fast track, uh, you know, would be very would be three years, let's say, from very inception of the initial meeting to when you open, and it could mm -hmm. easily be four or five, you know, six years. Um, Bonnie, with your group, uh, when did you first start? If you're planning to open January 2012, when did you, when did, was the very beginning of your efforts, your group's efforts? Um, the first kind of community meeting and the first formation of the co-op committee was in April 2008. Okay. So it would be almost four years uh, if you were able to open by January 2012. Right. So, yeah, and that, that would be, a, you know, again, something very, very much to celebrate. Um, oh, yeah. I other questions? Back on now if you want to, uh, I'm sorry, um, Mac is back on now if you want to continue. No, that's okay. Okay, well, we, we have, have another question from uh, Dean. Dean, will you want to tell us where you're from? Uh, I'm from Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, we have a group 
that is unorganized as of yet, uh, and we're the group thinking so far kind of runs counter to what I've been hearing today. We would like to get a feasibility study or a market study at least done before we launch our membership drive because we think, assuming this is going to be positive, uh, that would be a catalyst uh, to get members excited and want to join. If, if there's good news, that yes, this looks like it's a possibility today. What are the downsides to waiting uh, to organize until the market study is in? Well, I think that's a, a dilemma that is very common uh, for startup food co-ops. You know, when do you do some of the feasibility work, and might that the result of that feasibility work help you through the organizing stage? And uh, you know, I don't see a lot of downsides by uh, of having, let's say, a market study very early on. Um, you may need to have it updated. Uh, by the time you get to year three, um, you know, or year two, uh, or maybe maybe at this point you're looking at having a site located in such and such an area, although it's premature to probably be focused on a site, but um, you know maybe a two years or three years from now another site comes along, and so you may need to, you know, have a market study updated. Uh, it may or may not require an additional site visit. It may not be that costly to do that. Um, but you know, having the market study done early can certainly give you bring you valuable information. And uh, sometimes you can you can do you know a very rough or preliminary type of market study uh, that can give you an early kind of vote of confidence, and then wait to do that study. You know in you know, until you have, you know, some of the funds raised for it, for example, and you might have more funds available for it by stage 2A. So there are different ways to go, and there's not, you know, that's why designing a timeline and working with this four Cornerstones three-stage model, again, I say your co-op will resist that model, but the, the idea is to use some discipline and try to bring it into that and you know talk through these things and try to figure out what is most appropriate for your situation does that give, does it help at all Dean yeah yeah it does yeah so um, uh, Bonnie maybe I think both uh, um, Bonnie and Mac could comment on that and both co-ops had the market study done fairly early, uh, especially the Monadnock group did. So, Bonnie, do you have any comments on how useful that has been for you? Um, yeah, I think before we did the market study or did the feasibility, a group of people, including we had a city planner that's been working on the co-op committee with us, looked and used the marketing and trade skills that we had in the group to develop a, a trade our own definition of a trade area and look at the feasibility of the market and it ended up being pretty close to what um, Debbie from Cooperative Development Services put together so people have been talking about a co-op in Keene for the last I would say almost 30 years and I think people wish it were open yesterday is the kind of mentality in the community so I think we we chose to do the market study first based on uh, related to what Dean was saying that you know this is it's, it's important for the community, but the community really already knows that a co-op would be successful here. And it's really more for when we go for bank loans. Um, so we were kind of just trying to plan ahead. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the reasons that we tried to do the market study before the membership drive so that we could have it as, a, as one of those um, checkpoints and announce it as a press release to the community like yes the market feasibility or the market study was successful um, and just a way to, to energize the community and get excitement good so, uh, do we have other questions Marilyn uh, yes there's a question what are some of the common issues that cause a timeline to get off track uh, oh boy, uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I don't know if we can cover them all, but uh, uh, some of the common issues are um, 
losing sight of the timeline, not not kind of monitoring things. You know, maybe creating a timeline and then forgetting about it uh, happens quite a lot. And um, also, there can be kind of the timeline sets out things, and once you you try to have some control over this path that you're on, and sometimes there are things that are outside of your control that that come in. And for example, if you have set out a path where you're doing some initial organizing work and you're not so much focused on a site uh, until you get clear that you have enough people who are willing to support the idea of a food co-op and maybe you're planning to look at a site, do your site search work in stage two, but then all of a sudden a great site is available in stage one, and you know that site opportunity is not going to be there when you get to stage two, and so you think, oh, dear, should we commit to this site, and should we try to find a way to secure that site? And, you know, in in most regards, it's too early to do that. And in, with many food co-ops that I've talked with that have run into this, I would generally advise them to hold off. There will be other opportunities that will come along, and maybe that particular site will even still be there. Um, but it, it, when you start feeling pressures of saying, oh, we need to decide next week on this particular thing, and that wasn't really in our timeline, well, that can throw your whole timeline off and knock your organization off center, so to speak. Uh, and I would say nine times out of ten, it's best to you know, stick with your original with your original plan. Okay, thank you, Bill. That's what we have right now, and we're getting close to the end of the hour. So do you want to uh, finish up, and then I'll tell people about the evaluation. Yeah, good. Um, so uh, coming back to looking at our desired outcome for this session, um, you know, how to create a timeline to, and use it as a, as a management tool, hoping that you have a greater understanding of that and a greater understanding of what I mean by using a timeline as a management tool. Um, and how do, do you have an understanding of the four cornerstones and three stages um, development model? Uh, you can go to the Food Co-op 500 site or the CDS Consulting Co-op site and find out more information about that model, but the slides in here also will give you some background. But how do you integrate your co-op startup project into that? And, you know, if you need um, assistance with that process, you know, an hour or two of consulting work uh, could, could be very helpful to you at an early stage. Uh, and then how to manage your timeline um, to help you achieve accountability and avoid unrealistic expectations and build momentum. So there's a lot in that last item that we probably didn't get to cover, uh, but I think the key steps are learning, are practicing, practicing the, you know, the art and uh, skill of creating and um, revising timelines and uh, using timelines as a communication tool. So, you know, you can assess and we'll appreciate your evaluatory comments about if, if you feel that we've together achieved uh, our desired outcome here today. Uh, and we do have uh, the end of our 30 slides here. Um, uh, one reminder again that we do have these sample timelines will be available online as downloads in addition to the slides from this webinar. And um, you know, thank you very much. Um, my contact information is here. And uh, then I think we have additional webinars. And Marilyn, you're going to talk a little bit about that. Yes, and the next webinar is in two weeks with PJ Hoffman, Preliminary Store Design. And we're very excited to have PJ presenting this workshop. It's the first time in a webinar series that we've had PJ, and, and I think you'll all really enjoy hearing what he has to say. Um, if you haven't registered for that, you can go to cdsconsulting.coop and look under News and Events. Uh, 
when this webinar is over, there will be an evaluation, just a few short questions. Uh, we've really been getting very valuable feedback from the participants so far in this series and hope that those of you uh, who are on today will also complete that evaluation form. Um, thank you, uh, Bill. Thank you, Bonnie. And thank you, Mac, for your presentation today. And thank all of you participants for coming. Good luck, everybody.